good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, my name is Rose Judge, and I'm an open source engineer at VMware. Uh, today, I'm going to talk, you, talk to you about how you can improve your Git commits in two easy steps. So a little bit about me, as I mentioned, I'm an open source engineer at VMware, and in my role as an open source engineer, I wear a couple of different hats. Primarily, I'm an open source project maintainer for a project called TURN. TURN is a software composition analysis tool that's written in Python that will generate a software build of materials for your container images. And as a maintainer, I'm responsible for moving the project forward with features and bug fixes and really building a community around that project. And then my other role as an open source engineer is to grow open source impact within VMware. And part of the way I do that is by advocating for better open source practices within the company. And some of what I've observed in this aspect of my role is what inspired me to give this talk today. So I am excited to share um, with you all today. Um, I'm also a dog mom and a tiny human mom. Okay, so you may have seen this talk advertised and thought, Git commits, what on earth is she going to talk about for 45 minutes about Git commits? I mean, how hard can those be? Um, and maybe you really want to learn about how you can get started on your journey to contributing to open source or, um, you know, really getting that first pull request merged. And to that, I'd like to say that for any successful open source project, um, the quality of your Git commits will be equally as important as the code that you write. In fact, in most projects without a quality Git commit, you can't get the code that you write merged. Um, so understanding how to create and write really quality Git commits is going to be your first step towards getting um, your changes merged to a project. And um, that's one of the reasons that I really wanted to give this talk. Um, it's something that I think gets overlooked a lot. The power of good commits and com commit messages is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, it's a hill that I'm willing to die on. And that's what you see here in this slide is me atop the hill that I will die on. <laughs> um, and I think it's even more than a theoretical best practice. It's something I use every day and I've relied heavily on in my work in open source. Even before um, I worked on open source when I was working on proprietary code, I relied heavily on quality Git commits. Um, I've also been in involved with projects where the commits are maybe not so good. And I've witnessed how that can really be a disservice to the long-term prosperity of a project. Um, working in open source definitely forces this mentality. You're working with people from all over the globe. People are coming and going. Um, that your commits have to be good in order for anyone to understand what's going on. Um, but sometimes we can lose sight of that when we're hyper-focused on just the code um, or we're working on projects that are not open source. Um, and I know this conference is geared towards the open source community, but I truly believe that this talk is applicable to anyone working with Git. Um, so if you work on proprietary code and you just dabble in open source or you're an experienced developer or otherwise, I've seen extraordinary programmers who write horrible commit messages. So um, I hope that this presentation resonates with you no matter where you're at as a developer. Okay, before I dive into the heart of this presentation, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about some common vocabulary that you might hear me use. Um, I know that there's different kinds of version control software out there. Some of you might use GitLab or Mercurial or Perforce, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna assume that we're all working with GitHub workflows. I think that GitHub is the most widely used, especially for open source, um, and other version control software will have similar workflows that this talk can be applied to. Um, but throughout the presentation, you'll hear me use the phrasing commit and commit message. And I just wanted to make a quick point to differentiate these two terms. When I say commit in general, I'm talking about the change set in the code. So the actual diffs that you're changing in the code. Um, and that would be that box on the right in green. Um, the commit message is the summary explaining what your commit does, which is that purple box on the top. And then the pull request is what encapsulates both of these concepts where you'll have one or more commits. Each of those one or more commits will have a corresponding commit message. And when you bundle them all together, you open what GitHub calls a pull request, which is your submission of these changes to the actual open source project, which looks something like the image on the left um, with no box around it. So now that we're all on the same page, um, when I say git commit or git commit message, 
what comes to mind for you? Um, or what do you think of when I say that? For some of us, it may be this XKCD comic or something similar. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of jokes where your commit messages are depicted as just kind of nonchalant, simple descriptions about your changes um, that may even deteriorate into descriptions that have nothing to do with your code and instead just reflect your gentle, general sentiment at the moment. Um, especially if you're working in a repository that no one else works in or a private fork that you're planning to clean up later, your commit messages may, um, may be interesting. <laughs> um, and well, of course, I've been guilty of this type of commit. I, I cringe just a little bit when I see comics or jokes like this because I feel like it kind of perpetuates the stereotype that commits are just trivial, meaningless words or like a purposeless exercise um, that just has to be done and the box has to be checked before merging changes to a repository. Um, but I think good commits are so much more than that. They really have the power to transform a project. And I hope you will be convinced of that um, by the end of this presentation. So um, let's, let's dive in. What makes a good commit? If you've ever committed code or documentation or otherwise to a project, you've likely been through the process of um, structuring your commits and writing a commit message for them. And depending on the project you're working on, there may be requirements for what your commit message should look like in terms of length or structure. But when it comes really to how we break up our commits and what we write about them, what is the best practice? I know before I started working in open source uh, full time, my commits were always kind of an afterthought. Um, they sometimes looked like that comic on the previous slide. And you may have had this experience before too, where you've worked so hard just to get the code to work that committing the code is just a complete afterthought. And it's just, you know, you're like, okay, I just want to get it done and get this thing submitted and off my plate. Um, and maybe it doesn't always get the attention it deserves. So in order to change that experience, the next time you go to structure your commits and write commit messages for them, I would like to offer these two simple criteria that you can keep in your back pocket to make sure that your commits are excellent. And the first is that each commit does only one thing. The second is that each commit message should be its own self-contained story. So what exactly do I mean when I say each commit must only do one thing? Um, oftentimes code is very complicated. You're changing lots of functions, lots of files. They all kind of rely on each other. You're working towards some common goal. So naturally it feels like all of those changes should be grouped into one. Um, but then here I am telling you that it should only do one thing. So where do we start when we want to separate our commits so that they're each their own standalone story? Um, at a high level, I want you to think of your commit like a recipe. So if I were to show you this picture of a carrot cake and say, here are all the ingredients on the left, I want you to go make this cake and I want it to look like on the right. Would you know where to start? And for most of us, the answer is probably no without some sort of recipe that gives us directions about how to do it. So think of your pull request, which is that sum of all your commits as the cake. You would not expect someone to look at your PR and know what you did without a recipe. Um, and that recipe will explain each step of how you got to that final cake. And in this analogy, um, think of each of your commits as like one step of that recipe. So crack the eggs would be one commit, add the sugar would be one commit, mix the wet ingredients, another commit. I don't know if you've ever tried to follow a recipe where all the directions are crammed into like two paragraph long steps, um, but if you have, you know how hard that can be to follow along. And the same goes for your commits. If you submit a change with just one big commit of changes and it's, you know, 5,000 lines of code or even 30 lines of code, it can be really hard for the reviewer to understand what's actually going on in that change. Or to give you one more cake analogy, maybe you want to make this cake, but you're allergic to walnuts. So you want to remake it without the walnuts. The recipe is going to give you the blueprint of how to do that. Having each step separated and each ingredient separated out, you could look through that recipe and trace back to find the step that adds the walnuts and then leave it out when you make the cake the second time around. And the same is true for your commits. If you encounter an issue with a set of changes, your commits are a list of steps that you can take to trace back to see where the problem was introduced. So think of a bug as a walnut in this case. One big commit would be like one of those cake mixes you get where all the ingredients are already mixed together. And if that's what your commit looks like, you'd have to sift through that cake mix to get the walnuts out um, and pull them out yourself. 
Same thing if you're trying to trace back through one giant commit to find an error, right? You're going to have to painfully sift through all of those big hunks of change um, to find that one line of code that may be causing the error. Um, and you might be thinking, well, you know, sifting out walnuts is not that hard from a cake mix. Like I just get a sifter and then the walnuts are big and don't go through the sifter. But as your project scales, those walnuts are going to shrink to the size of poppy seeds, which are going to be much harder to sift out. Um, so this is why it's important to keep your commits small and only doing one thing. But enough about cake. Um, if we want to avoid sifting through large change sets in order to find specific code that may have been introduced as a bug, how do we break up our commits to facilitate this? Let's assume you have all your changes ready to go and you're ready to open that pull request. So when you start to break up your commits, think of writing that recipe. Each step, each commit is going to do one thing. And all of the steps put together are going to tell a story of how to make your cake. So looking at this list, I don't want you to worry too much about memorizing it. These points are not like step-by-step -step requirements in any particular order. They're all very high level, and we'll get into what some examples for each of them might look like. So when you go about breaking up your commits, you might start by isolating your non-functional changes. Maybe you're updating documentation, or maybe you're copying and pasting code from one file to another. Those would both qualify as non-functional, right? Things where no code is actually changed. Um, and so, for example, like you might remove trailing white spaces from a file, or you might update the readme. Like each of those are non-functional changes. Um, next, you could look at your functional changes. Maybe you're adding a new function. Let me move my box here. There we go. Um, that new function definition might be one commit. Or if you're renaming a function, maybe changing the name of the function throughout the code is one commit. Another example might be making changes to an API. And let's say that you're adding a function parameter. Instead of adding the parameter and changing it at the same time, you might separate those two commits since they're each doing one thing. And then if any part of your changes are related to code cleanup, each cleanup step should get its own commit. Um, oftentimes code cleanup will occur in parallel with new functionality, um, but you'll still wanna separate the code cleanup from the new feature. So let's take a look at an example of how this might be done. Let's say that you were tasked with implementing a new feature. And as you're building out this feature, you realize that there's some duplicated code in two separate files. And as part of your code cleanup, you're going to replace this duplicated code with a new helper function. And then within that helper function is where you're actually going to implement your new feature. So while it might seem reasonable to combine all of this into one commit, since all the changes are working towards that one feature, combining them all um, into one large commit would be misleading in the change log. If someone looked at your commit and just saw add new feature X, they would have no idea about the helper function and code cleanup that also took place. Um, additionally, if the new helper function was combined with a new feature, Say in the future you wanted to go and deprecate the new feature, well, that would be really easy if the new feature was its own patch. You could just revert that patch. But if it's combined with this new helper function in this code cleanup, you're going to end up reverting all of that, which could have a lot of unintended consequences in the future. So instead, if we separate the code cleanup from the functional changes, we can create two commits that each do one thing that make the code a lot easier to maintain and debug in the future. And then my last note about breaking up your commits is that none of your commits should break the build, which means that um, at each commit, the code should compile. So in your development, what that means is if you were introducing a new function in your changes, you wouldn't make a call to that function before a commit that actually defined the function um, because you would get an error that says like, I don't know what this function is. So keep your commits ordered in a way that they don't break the build. And then now seems like a good time to also differentiate between development and the actual act of committing your code. When you're developing, it's perfectly okay to write all of your changes as one big change set, right? I think a lot of us do it this way. You don't need to develop in the same way that you eventually organize your commit messages. Um, in fact, when you're breaking up your commits, 
um, to do only one thing. Git has several commands that can help you break up your changes. Personally, I like to commit early and often when I'm developing. Um, this helps me just organize my code better um, and then makes the commit process easier for me when I'm getting ready to open a pull request. But if you just like to write out all your code first and then think of how you want to organize it and break it up at the end, that works too. I have a coworker, um, he's a Linux kernel maintainer, and he's a big fan of like writing all of his changes and then mirroring them in the order he wants to commit on a new branch once he's ready to open a pull request. So that works for him, it may work for you. You may have your own way of doing this, um, but git commit p can be really helpful if you do like to write all your changes and then break them up at the end. Um, it allows you to commit just hunks of a change. So if you have multiple hunks, um, of changes in a single file, you can pick and choose which hunk you want to associate with, with which commit. Um, and that can be really helpful, um, breaking one big change into smaller steps. Git rebase-i is also really helpful for going back and editing your commits or editing your commit messages. And um, while GitHub is really powerful in helping you structure your commits, uh, it so that they're each doing one thing. It also has tools like Git Squash, which can make this task harder to do successfully. Git Squash is a command that will muddle smaller commits into one big commit. So it will like combine those recipe steps into just one big step. Um, and at times this may be completely appropriate. You may even be asked to do this. Like say you went overboard separating your commits and the maintainer's like, hey, can you squash these two? That may be appropriate. But um, in general, and for the scope of this talk, I would advise against using Git squash to create giant hunks of change. Um, remember that each pull request will be, um, will have those separated out steps that are the recipe to your cake. Okay, once you've separated out your commits so that each is only doing one thing using some of those criteria we just discussed, the second step um, to improving your Git commits is writing an informative commit message. Um, and this is what I see a lot of people um, struggling with. Um, I think it's really easy to just, you know, write a really simple commit title, but um, the commit message is, should really be its own self-contained story and contain all the necessary information. So I learned best with an example. Let's start with this diff. Um, I don't want you to worry about reading this patch or even trying to understand the code. I know I don't, um, but let's take a look at the commit message um, because any good commit message should be able to tell me what's happening without actually having to read the code. So here's the commit message. Um, it says removes, uh, removes the need to clear it along with the races, okay? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> so even if this commit is properly doing only one thing and it's broken up correctly, um, the commit message tells us nothing and it leaves the reader very confused with what's going on. And then if we look at this one, again, don't worry about the code, but let's say I have a forked version of the kernel that I'm using and I'm trying to find a potential bug fix patch by looking through the change log. If I get to this commit, maybe I look at the code and I think like, okay, this seems reasonable. This might be a fix. I wanna pull in this patch. Let me look at the commit message and see if I can find any more information. All it says is no instances left. So now I'm sad because I'm going to have to do a bunch more manual digging and testing to try to find my a potential bug fix patch. So those two examples are cases where um, there wasn't enough inform information or context in the commit message. So what should a good commit message look like? And in general, when you're writing your commit message, I want you to keep the reviewer in mind. Um, you should assume that the reviewer has never seen the code you're adding or removing before. And I know when I say that, it sounds a little crazy. Like if they're the maintainer of a project, shouldn't they know all about the code in that project? Shouldn't they know what's changing or like understand it just by looking at it? And in a perfect world, the answer would be yes. But in reality, the maintainer or reviewer of your pull request is a human. Um, they have other things going on. They may be looking at, you know, 20 pull requests a day or even five pull requests a day is a lot. Um, you as someone opening a pull request have likely been working on the issue for at least a day. In some cases, maybe you're implementing a new feature. You've been working on it for three weeks or three months. And so you're zoned in on your changes. You have tunnel vision looking at those changes. You know exactly what's going on with them. Um, 
the reviewer doesn't have that benefit. Um, they might may not have ever looked at this part of the code if the project's big enough. Um, so your commit message should assume that they've never seen the code. And if it provides enough context, then the reviewer can jump right in, ultimately getting your pull request merged faster. And then similarly, your commit message should assume the reviewer has no context about why the change is being made. Maybe your PR is fixing an issue that the reviewer hasn't seen or didn't even know was a bug. Um, sometimes there's multiple maintainers for a project, and maybe you had a discussion with one of them about, oh, I'm going to open a pull request for this change, but the one who's reviewing it didn't know about that conversation, right? Make sure you include context in your commit message as to why you're making these changes versus how you're making them. Your commit message should also be clear enough that the newcomer to the project could understand what's going on. And this is really important for the sustained longevity of a project. Eventually, the maintainers of today will become maintainers of the past. They'll move on to other projects. Um, and the people who are newcomers today may become maintainers of the future. So it's important that your commit be clear to both of these people. Um, and this is really important if in the future they're trying to trace a bug back to your commit. Um, having the context in the commit message is going to allow them to do that a lot faster um, if the readers know what's going on. And then finally, a good commit message will be concise and consistent. So you might hear me say, like, your commit message has to contain enough information that a newcomer knows what's going on and think like, well, that means that I'm going to be writing a commit message that's like a novel. <laughs> um, so no, I'm not saying that you need to write a 20 page or 20 paragraph origin story about how your commit came to be. Um, providing enough context and information can be done in a concise matter. And the more you practice it, the better it's going to be. Um, the more consistent, the more concise your commit messages are going to be. OK, so what type of information specifically should your commit message contain? Um, when you write a good commit message in general, a good way to test if you have enough information in there is to ask yourself, like, would I be able to understand what's going on in this commit a year from now when I've completely moved on to another project? I think sometimes when we're writing commit messages, we think, well, I wrote this commit. Like, if anyone has questions, they'll just come and ask me and I'll tell them what's going on. But this is not... Um, particularly practical in open source when you're working across numerous time zones or you're at a company like VMware where everyone's working remote and you can't just walk over to someone's cube and ask them to explain their code or explain the changes that they made. Um, we need to really be able to rely on the commit messages. And then when you're writing your commit message, um, you're going to start with that subject line. And in that subject line, you're going to summarize um, the change of your commit. So this should be descriptive enough that someone reading it would have a general idea of what you're doing. So, um, for example, like move function A from file A to file B, like something that's just clear and to the point. Um, the body of your commit message will be your explanation of why you're making the change. And in that body explanation, your goal is to summarize any and all relevant information. And then at the end of the summary, you might also include links to relevant outside references, like a related discussion on a mailing list or a forum. It might be a reference to a GitHub issue or links to a ticket or bug report. Um, GitHub actually makes referencing issues um, or other pull requests very easy and it looks very pretty in the web UI. So um, use that to your advantage. Just to know if you are including any type of URL or link, it's important that enough context exists in the commit message itself that the reader doesn't have to click on the link to understand your changes. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. One is that the person reading your commit message might not have time to click through all the links and like piece together how they relate to each other. And two is that um, it is the internet and that link may not exist forever. So your description should make sense on its own without having to click on the link. If your commit is related to a bug fix, be sure to include any error messages that your code might be fixing. This is really helpful later down the line, making your changelog searchable. If someone hits that same error message and tries to search in the changelog for a fix, they'll be brought right to your, um, right to your commit. Um, 
And then the last thing I put here is uh, nice to have, like mention how you arrived at your change. Um, I added this because if you spend a bunch of time working on a change and maybe you tried a few iterations um, of the implementation and your commit is the final version of it, if someone goes back to look at your commit, they can see why you did it that way and that you've already done the work exploring other implementation methods um, and they don't need to redo that work. Um, so your thoughtful commit message might save someone time down the line and that person might even be you if you're like someone's like why did you implement it this way you can go back to your commit message and say oh yeah that's why i did it that way um when it's you know six months later and nine months later and then once you've written your commit message and it contains all of the information it needs to have i have a few formatting pointers here they're all pretty straightforward um, and will help with the overall aesthetic prettiness factor of your commit, which doesn't seem like it should be important, but when a reviewer is looking through lots of changes, um, the readability factor of your commit is important. So for the title, um, which is that section in blue, um, you should wrap your title at 50 characters. And this helps your change log look clean. When you do a git log dash dash one line, it keeps the title fully visible in that log. Um, if you're having a hard time summarizing what's happening in the change in 50 characters, you might be committing too many changes. And maybe you revisit um, and make sure that your commit really is only doing one thing. Um, you might prefix your subject line with a one word category and um, this won't always be applicable or necessary, um, but sometimes it will so maybe you prefix it with bug fix or doc or tests um, words that describe where the changes are taking place or what they're related to. Sometimes if you're trying to meet that 50 character limit in the title, this isn't always feasible, um, but again, it makes your change log more searchable. Uh, capitalize the subject line just like you would if you were writing a sentence, except with a sentence you would put a period at the end and for your commit titles you're going to ditch the period, you don't need it. Um, it also saves you a character in that 50 character limit. <laughs> and then lastly for the commit subject you want to use the imperative mood so imperative is um, spoken or written as giving a command or instruction, so you would say refactor test code instead of refactored past tense or refactoring like current um, remove uh, deprecate uh, a good way to check that you're using the imperative mood is adding if applied this commit will to the beginning of your commit message so if applied this commit will refactor test code and that sentence should grammatically make sense for the body of your commit message, you want to make sure that there's a blank line between the title and the body. Um, you'll also want to wrap the lines at 72 characters. In terms of formatting, you can use paragraphs, you can use bullet points, you can use a mix of the two, but um, try to avoid having one super long paragraph or like 50 bullet points. Um, use your best judgment here. Um, make sure it's readable. Um, and again, think of the reviewers as you're opening or as you're writing these commit messages. We're just going for readability. If you're referencing a GitHub issue using keywords um, like you would see at the bottom, like resolves or see also in general, summarize these at the end before you're signed off, before the signed off line by the signed off by line so you would have um, you know the body you would have a space resolves the number a blank line and then um, signed off by your name okay and then this slide is just a quick pulse pulse check with some references of other industry-wide best practices um, similar to what i've mentioned up until this point so if you're interested in reading more about what i've discussed um, or you just are, aren't convinced or don't believe me, there's some links here um, that you can look check out. So a good commit message really boils down to a good story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It has all the relevant details clearly summarized so that no one finishes reading your change log and thinks, I'm confused why they did that. Um, now, of course, if you've properly broken up your changes so that each really only does one thing, commit A in the series may rely on commit B in some way, and you might want to communicate that in your commit message. What I mean by self-contained here is basically to make sure that you're explaining any assumptions related to future or past commits. Um, so I've seen like a series of commits where 
where a commit says something like, see next patch for more information. And the trouble with that phrasing is that the next patch may not actually be what you think it is once it gets merged. Um, so instead of saying see next commit, you might say something like in order to enable X future functionality, we first have to add Y function in this commit, like something that's a little more descriptive and contextual. So if you remember way back to this example of what not to do from earlier, I wanted to resurface this again as a good example of why a self-contained story is so important. Um, the context behind this commit is that this was actually the end of a patch series where all the previous commits in the series removed all the instances, but we would have no idea how this commit related to the previous ones just by looking at this commit message. So on its own, it's fairly confusing. So I'm not saying that your commits can't be dependent on other commit messages. They likely will if you're making complex changes, but you should put any reference of previous related commits in context to make it more clear. And to really um, hammer this idea home, I wanted to finish with a good example of a good commit message. So this is a small change. Um, it's broken up to only do one thing. And then if we look at the commit message, it might be a little longer, a little more uh, thorough than you would expect, right? And you don't need to read all of this text. Um, but I like this example because it shows that your code changes don't have to be big in order to warrant a thorough commit message. Sometimes the smallest changes fix bugs that need to be a little more verbosely explained in the change log and in your commit message. So in this example, we clearly understand what the commit is doing from the title. And then if we read the commit message, we see references to other commits Commits, there's an explanation of why the change was made um, and what bug it's fixing. So there's context there, it's self-contained, and it's reader friendly. Okay, so I've been talking for 30-ish minutes about how to break up and write good commits. Some of you might be thinking like, well, I can see why this is important for a project like the kernel or Kubernetes, like some giant project with thousands of contributors, but I work on an open source project with one other contributor, or maybe I don't even work in open source um, uh, and I work it on proprietary code. Um, and I know everyone on the team, so this is, doesn't apply to us. And regardless of whether your project is open or closed sourced, good commits will follow these two principles of each commit does one thing and each commit, commit message is a self-contained story. Um, separating your commits and writing detailed commit messages, it may seem like a lot of work, especially if you're not used to writing commit messages like that, like this, um, but I promise it's worth it, um, and I'll go into why in a few slides. Okay, so good commits enable support for um, a downstream stable version of the project, um, and I think a kernel, the kernel is a really good example of this. Let's say that you have a stable branch that only pulls in certain features from a development branch. If you break up your commits so that they're each only doing one thing, it makes the downstream stable version of the project possible, right? It makes it possible for you to only pull in certain features without having to pull in a bunch of unnecessary code that needs to be tested and maintained. Um, and this is what would happen if you submitted like giant hunks of a change. You'd have no choice but to pull in the whole thing, even if you wanted just one little feature in that giant hunk. Um, good commits also make future debugging easier. So if you encounter a regression in the future and you need to figure out what caused the problem, working with smaller commits that only do one thing makes it possible to find that exact point in time where something went wrong. If your commits are each doing 10 things, there's no way to test exactly which part of the change broke the build, right? You just have to pull out the whole thing. Um, and hope that it works. So think back to that cake example. If you wanna take out walnuts from your recipe, it's gonna be easier to do this when the walnuts are separate from the other ingredients versus having that cake mix where they're already mixed in. And then in any long running project, there will come a time when code cleanup is required and good commits help facilitate this cleanup. Um, for example, if you write in your commit message, this change was made to support X feature and a year from now you deprecate feature X, you know that you can safely remove that commit um, that was there to support feature X without any regressions. Um, so in this way, good commit messages help keep the code lean and maintainable. 
Uh, good commits are also like an easy and very cheap insurance policy against your project or against attrition in your project. Um, and this is true for closed source projects as well. If any contributor to your project suddenly leaves the community um, or leaves the company or wins the lottery and decides they're never going to write a line of code in their life again, good commits make it possible for the project to continue without them. And then let's see, I have... Um, it helps facilitate working with folks in different time zones. So if you've ever worked with folks from ac across the globe, um, good commits will enable the development process to continue even while some contributors sleep. <laughs> so I just had a baby. The idea, the notion of sleep is very foreign to me, but um, for those who do like to sleep, um, good commits will enable one person in a different time zone to keep working, um, even when they have questions about why the change was made. They can just turn to the commit message instead of having to go ask the person who wrote it on Slack. And then lastly, you can think of good commits, commit messages for your commits, like the same way you would think of good documentation for your open source project. Um, if they are detailed and organized, new contributors are able to look into the project and get an idea of what's going on. They can just jump right in and know what's happening without having to ask a bunch of questions, um, which just creates more work for everyone. Okay, so if at any point in this presentation you thought to yourself like, okay, Maybe I'm kind of convinced. I can see why good, structured, detailed commit messages are useful, and maybe I have room to improve. Like, let's be honest, we all do. Um, how can you start to put these changes into practice? And I really encourage you to just start today, like plain and simple. Even if your project is a year old and you haven't ever focused on commits in the past, like you can start making your commits better today breaking up your commits so they only do one thing, and then writing that detailed commit message for that one thing. After that, put your commit requirements and expectations in your project documentation. And if you're a contributor to a project that doesn't have these expectations laid out, open a bug or open a pull request um, to encourage the project maintainers to write out their expectations in that contributing file or in the readme. Um, especially if you're a maintainer of a project, whether it's an open source project or a closed source project, having your commit requirements laid out save you time when you get a new contributor to your project who opens a pull request with a subpar commit message, instead of having to seem biased or like giving them a long winded explanation of what you're looking for, you have something concrete, you can just point to contributing and say like, I need you to revise your pull request or your commit message in accordance with these standards. And then when you're writing your code, lead by example, like no matter who you are on the project, write the commit message, break up your commits, um, in a way that you want to read a year from now. If you had to debug something in your code, like break up your commits in a way that would make it easy to do that and painless to do that. Um, and you wouldn't be left scratching your head or kicking yourself and wishing that you had in the future. Small changes that do one thing will make any future debugging a lot less painless. A lot more painless, less pain. <laughs> and then um, by that same token, it's important to hold others accountable for their commits. And this can be really hard. Um, it definitely takes practice when you have maybe a super productive developer on your team and they write amazing code um, and you really appreciate the code that they write, but then they write a really sloppy commit message with it. Sometimes the last thing you want to say is like, please fix your commits. I cannot merge this until your commits are better. Um, if you're working towards a milestone too, and you're like crunched for time, and you're like, okay, I'm just going to merge this. And then I'm, I'm, I'll worry about the commit messages later. Like it can be really hard to hold others accountable. Um, but know that by holding others accountable to these standards, it creates a culture of continuous improvement, which makes your project and the engineers who work on it better and more accessible. So with that, I want to thank you for your time today. <clears throat> I think we have like seven or eight-ish minutes. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and if not, you can find me on Twitter or you can check out Turn on GitHub or ping me in the chat.